And yes, before anyone comes at me to state the obvious, I do recognize that in our society, it would not be well responded to if Disney had a topless Disney princess. I'm just merely pointing out the historical inaccuracy. Hey everyone, I am back today with the second part of my Disney princess um, rating series. <laughs> For those of you who are new here, basically in this two-part series, I rate Disney princesses um, on their main dresses, aka the dresses that Disney uses to market the most, and I rate them out of 10 on historical accuracy and style. You definitely don't need to watch the first part of the video. I highly recommend it because it gets me more views, but um, you definitely don't need to watch the first part to understand this part. I'm just going to be doing a different set of Disney princesses, um, starting with Mulan, Tiana, Rapunzel, Merida, Elsa, Anna, and Moana. So if your favorite wasn't listed, they're definitely in the previous video and I'll leave a link for that down in the description box. Also, as just a note, I did get some requests for like specific Disney characters and I'm only doing for this series, the Disney princesses in the official Disney lineup as designated by Disney. So if you have a problem with who's in the lineup, take it up with the mouse, but I think in the future maybe I would do another series like this. I don't really know. It just kind of depends on what people want from me. Which brings me to my next point. If you have an idea you're dying for me to do, um, don't hesitate. Ask and you shall receive if I've seen the content and if I like it. Okay, so I'm just learning upon editing that Elsa and Anna are not official Disney princesses, which is super embarrassing for me, but I already researched and recorded their sections, so I'm just going to leave them in because it would be a shame if I just removed stuff that I already recorded. But that said, let's get started with Mulan. Mulan is my favorite Disney princess. I don't know if there's anything that makes that obvious. But we're not here today to listen to a lengthy TED talk on why Mulan was the most groundbreaking Disney princess of her time, why she's a beacon of tenacity and ambition, and why she's an icon for Asian American girls, trans boys, and other gender non-conforming people alike. No, we're going to be talking about something much more important than all of that. Her dress. So Mulan has actually been marketed in a ton of different dresses. Most of them look like an amalgamation of her green dress and her pink dress, though others are completely different. For the sake of just pinpointing one, I'm choosing her pink dress because it is her most formal dress and also the dress that my beloved Mulan doll is wearing, so I'm partial to it. We know that the movie takes place in northern China because the Tangshao Pass is located in northern China. Disney also adapted Mulan from the Ballad of Mulan, which was most likely composed during the Northern Wei period, around 400 CE, despite inaccuracies in the movie that point otherwise. As for Mulan's main dress, it looks most similar to dresses from the Tang and Song dynasties. We can even see one of the girls in the Honor to Us All musical number wearing this kind of forehead decoration, which was popular during the Tang and Song dynasties. Mulan is also wearing a type of hanfu called Qi Yao Rushen, aka Waist High Rushen. A Rushen, translated to English, is literally just top and skirt. It's a form of hanfu, which is a general term for historical Han Chinese clothing. The waist tie Rushen is cross collared, and we see Mulan is wearing a purple long scarf, probably made of silk called a pibo as well. The apron-like top skirt she's wearing is called a wei chang. The dress is actually very accurate to historical Chinese clothing. It's just 300 years early. With that said though, the elements of the Han Fu, such as the top and skirt, the broad sleeves, um, the crossed collar, don't change that much over time. So I would give Mulan about a seven out of 10 on historical accuracy. The dress is at least historical and a non-offensive portrayal of ancient Chinese clothing, which is more than we can say about some other princesses. I never realized how incredibly fancy. Now let's look at the Northern Wei period. During this period, the woman's ruchen was usually composed of a wide crossed collar top that reveals an underlayer with a circular neckline and an elaborate finely pleated skirt tied at the waist. A long sash would wrap around the waist and its ties would trail down the front. 
The sleeves were also excessively wide. There's also a garment called the Zaju, which is a formal hanfu for upper class women. There's some debate on which class Mulan's family belongs to because there are no servants depicted in the movie and she's seen working, which implies a lower status, but her family also owns a hugely vast piece of land, which indicates nobility. If Mulan is of higher status, it is possible for her to be wearing this dress. These dresses would have decorative overlapping triangular cloth pieces that hang like banners on the skirt of the dress. There is still some debate on whether the cloth pieces are attached to the skirt or the robe. These dresses also had long silk ribbons that would extend from the top skirt. For style, I would give Mulan a 10 out of 10. I am fully biased because I think that um, Chinese hanfu are one of the most beautiful kinds of clothing in human history. I love the silhouette, the long broad sleeves. I love the silk purple scarf accessory. It's all very elegant and I think she looks like a fairy. I always wanted to be her when I was younger so yes I am fully biased and I admit that but it is a very beautiful dress. This gives Mulan a score of 8.5 out of 10. Next we have Tiana. So The Princess and the Frog quite obviously takes place in the 1920s in New Orleans and let me just preface by saying the 1920s is one of my favorite uh, fashion eras in the entirety of Western fashion. And since Tiana is our most contemporary princess, and because there is such an abundance of resources going back to 1920s clothing, one would assume that Disney would make a historically accurate costume for her. And one would assume wrong. <laughs> Tiana, we're going to give you a 1 out of 10 on historical accuracy. The dress is very obviously ball gown shaped. It definitely follows Cinderella's footprints. One of the most reliable ways of dating a dress is looking at the silhouette, and the silhouette is very, very period inaccurate. In reality, 1920s dresses were known for their drop waists, rising hemlines, and tubular silhouettes. The shift from 1910s Edwardian fashion to the 1920s was actually pretty severe and a lot of it had to do with changing ideals in society. During the 20s, white women gained the right to vote and started enrolling in high schools and colleges and entering the workforce at higher rates than ever before. Women started drinking, dancing the Charleston, smoking, and hooking up in parked cars. They revealed their legs the first time in Western history. That was huge. As you can see, clothing trends reflect societal ideals and vice versa. There is another type of dress though called the robe de steel, which was introduced by Jean Lanvin in 1919. This dress was heavily influenced by 17th and 18th century dresses and offered an alternative for women looking for something more feminine than the flapper look. These dresses had long, full skirts that were sometimes so long and full that women would wear panniers, side petticoats, or hoops underneath. Following trends of the period, these dresses were often ornamented with beads, art deco designs, and cross-cultural motifs such as Chinese embroidery. The robe de steel definitely looks more compatible with Disney's whole ball gown aesthetic, so I could totally imagine Tiana wearing something like this. Oh wait, I don't have to imagine because one peek at the Disney concept art and we can see they actually did design her with the robe de steel dress. So for whatever reason, during some point of the production process, they booted these historically accurate depictions to go for a dress that is much more fanciful. Maybe because the drop waist isn't considered in vogue by today's standards and they were worried Tiana's dress wouldn't sell so well, it remains a mystery. However, despite these inaccuracies, I do love Tiana's dress the way that it is. I think it's very cool that the dress incorporates elements from her surroundings. The flower look is very haute couture. I love the petals on the dress, the well-placed vine, and the green color looks super flattering on her. So I'm giving this dress a 10 out of 10 for style. This gives Tiana a combined score of 5.5 out of 10. I will say though that style for sure outweighs the historical accuracy in this movie. Moving on to Rapunzel. So according to directors Byron Howard and Nathan Greeno, Tangle takes place in the 1780s. Corona is a magical place of course, but was heavily inspired by Germany, so let's say 1780s Germany. There were a couple of different outfits at this time. The robe a la Francaise was going out of style, and so what we start seeing in the late 1700s include the robe a l'anglaise, the robe polonaise, the robe a l'anglaise retroussé, the robe a la Turc, among others. Unfortunately, Rapunzel's dress does not look like any of them. So for historical accuracy, we're giving her a 1 out of 10. 
Rapunzel looks a lot like she's wearing a Renfair costume rather than anything historically accurate. There are also other historical inaccuracies in the movie, um, such as the king's 16th century getup. According to the creators though, Mother Gothel's dress was purposely designed to look several centuries old to convey how old she actually is, which I can respect. If I was to revise this dress, I'd probably put Rapunzel in a chemise a Lorraine or a gall, which is the dress that Marie Antoinette popularized in the 1780s. This makes the most sense to me because the chemise a Lorraine balances between formal and informal dress. It's formal in the sense that Marie Antoinette wore it, and it's informal in the sense that it resembles a chemise, aka a woman's underlayer, hence the name. Marie Antoinette was our first hashtag cottagecore queen and had a rustic garden called the Amour de Lorraine, which was built in Versailles in the early 1780s for her to escape royal pressures. She started wearing the chemise a Lorraine during this time period and struck up a major controversy among French nobles. As I said before, the chemise a Lorraine resembled the chemise a bit too much, and the portrait of her wearing one was akin to a portrait of a queen in her underwear. Many nobles also didn't like the idea of dressing simpler because it allowed um, lower classes to dress more similarly to them. Oh, the horror. The gown itself was made of several layers of white muslin cotton, had a ribbon drawstring at the neck, a colored sash at the waistline, and a soft, fully gathered skirt. The muslin was imported from India, which also stirred controversy because Marie was seen as being unpatriotic by not supporting her own country's silk production. Even though the dress is completely white and Rapunzel is known for wearing purple, I think it would be a perfect dress for Rapunzel because it is essentially a fancy peasant dress. For reasons unknown to us, Rapunzel seems like she's wearing royal attire throughout the whole movie, which is why I opt for the chemise a Lorraine instead of an actual 1780s peasant dress. The chemise a Lorraine was more comfortable than other clothing at the time, not requiring a pannier, and would make more functional sense for Rapunzel. Also similar to Marie Antoinette, Rapunzel was hidden away from her palace in a rustic tower of her own, albeit not by choice. In terms of style, I don't really like Rapunzel's dress, to be honest. I think it looks pretty low-budget Halloween costume-like, and most of that is because of the lace trim on the um, sleeves, the bodice, and the skirt hem. I think it looks just kind of tacky, and then the purple and pink color combination is not really known to be an elegant combination. Also, yeah, I don't know why. It has just this satiny quality that looks kind of cheap. I don't know. Maybe Mother Gothel did not provide Rapunzel with quality fabrics in her tower, and she's supposed to look cheap. Who's to say? For style, I give her a 4 out of 10, which gives her a combined score of 2.5 out of 10. So now let's talk about Merida. Brave takes place in the 10th century. This was confirmed at the D23 Expo. However, in another interview I found, co-director Mark Andrews says that they looked at the 9th to 12th centuries and took all the stuff that they liked and made a fantasy Scotland. But for the purposes of the video, let's go with the 10th century because it narrows it down a little bit more. Let's take a look at Merida's primary dress. Her dress is made up of a cream-colored chemise and a dark blue kirtle that she wears on the top. Her sleeves have slashing details at the shoulders and elbows, which reveal her chemise underneath. What Merida's wearing is not really accurate. The slashed sleeve detail was definitely not characteristic of the time period. Actually, her dress looks like those from a Waterhouse painting more than anything Scottish women actually wore. I'll give Merida a 5 out of 10 for accuracy because at least the elements are there like the cloak, the tunic, and the belt, but it's just the details that are off. In reality, Merida should be wearing a lena, which is a tunic that is usually ankle length. A shorter lena existed but was seen as a mark of low status because the wearer probably was involved in physical labor. So Merida as a royal princess would have an ankle length lena. The lena was worn over a shift and was usually made of linen, but nobles would wear silk ones. The Book of Kells also depicts bands of trim on almost every single lena at the hem, the cuffs, and the neckline. The neckline could range from circular to a wide V-shape. The lena was often belted with a woven or leather belt called a creos. It kept the tunic in place but also was used to carry objects and utensils. Instead of the simple cape she's wearing, Merida would wear a brat. The brat is a cloak usually made of wool. It's pinned to the wearer with a brooch 
It was also a status symbol with the wealthier wearing heavily embroidered, more voluminous ones with details such as fur trim or fringe. Later designs incorporated a hood, but in the 10th century, um, the wearer would draw over the folds of the brat as a protective head covering. A note about the brooch, surviving brooches from before 800 CE were beautifully styled panannular brooches with enamel, inlaid stones, gold, and silver. Only the royal golden brooches were annular, but after 900 CE, only simple thistle brooches could be found. We don't really know why that's the case, but Merida would wear a simple thistle brooch, I guess, in line with 10th century. Some argue that men would pin their brat over the shoulder and a woman would pin their brat over the torso in the center. However, there are examples in the Book of Kells that show otherwise, so it's safe to assume that the brat was pinned however the wearer preferred. As for style, Merida's dress is pretty simple. The muted forest green, I think, works well for her character, being adventurous and free-spirited and whatnot. And, you know, I'm not mad about it. It's not awful. It looks good with her red hair. But the dress itself, I just don't have, I guess, that much of an opinion on. It's just a very simple dress. So, um, yeah, I'll give it a 6 out of 10 for style. This gives Merida a 6.5 out of 10. Now moving on to the Frozen Sisters. So, according to the Art of Frozen, early costume designs placed the store in the late 1700s, but then they decided to change it to the 1840s because apparently the 1840s gave the story a more classical fairy tale look. And then Arendelle is based on the city of Bergen in Norway. So, 1840s Norway is what we're dealing with. I also want to give a quick shout out to Faustina Teresa on Instagram before we get started because I was using a lot of Norwegian resources for this and had some trouble translating from Norwegian to English and I would not be able to do this without her help, so thank you. Let's talk about Elsa first. For Elsa's dress, it should be obvious to everyone that she gets a 1 out of 10 on historical accuracy. It is a very modern, tight-fitting silhouette with a thigh slit, and yes, even though Elsa conjures up her dress, it would make more sense for her to conjure one up following trendy silhouettes of the time period. When I thought about a historically accurate dress that she would wear instead, I mostly looked at paintings of Josephine of Lichtenberg, who was the queen consort of Sweden and Norway during the 1840s. She seems to follow the general European trends, which include long-waisted bodices, short or elbow-length sleeves, and full floor-length skirts gathered at the waist. This bodice shape was achieved by this kind of corset. Elsa's neckline would be off the shoulder, either straight or en cur. We see a lot of necklines trimmed with a bertha. Daywear dresses were pretty simple, but trimmings could be more extensive on evening dresses with lace, ribbon, and artificial flowers. Compared to the 1830s, which had these exuberant puffs and these over-the-top full-length skirts, um, the 1840s had a very droopy feeling. This is because uh, the 1840s fashion did take a lot of inspiration from the Gothic Revival architecture movement in the 18th century. But you know, that's just the historical background for this. I can definitely see why Disney would not want to give Elsa an 1840s silhouette, mainly because the whole marketing power of Frozen is that it's like this feminist Disney princess story and Elsa is so different from all the other Disney princesses because she doesn't end up with a man or whatever. <laughs> Don't get me wrong, Frozen is a feminist story. The only thing is that I think in the discourse, we kind of conflate the ideas of feminism with being single, at least in the terms of media for girls. And I don't know, I think saving China is a pretty big deal, is a pretty feminist ideal. And we shouldn't forget about that just because Mulan invited Shang over for dinner at the end of the movie. Would you like to stay for dinner? Would you like to stay forever? But yeah, I can see why opting for a ball gown that is reminiscent of the earlier Disney princesses would kind of go against the whole fresh approach that Frozen was taking, so. For style, I would probably give Elsa a 9 out of 10. Her dress is honestly the dress we should have given Ariel, but it's fine. The sparkle detail is a hallmark Disney princess, but also makes sense given that she made the dress out of snow and ice. The blue looks good with her blonde hair, um, and I love the sheer cape that flows behind her. My only complaint is that I think the sleeves make the dress more awkward, but I think sheer opera gloves would have looked nicer. 
Just my opinion. This gives Elsa a combined score of 5 out of 10. Moving on to Anna. So one thing that's peeved me since I started my foray into Norwegian folkware is the misuse of the term bunad. I've seen the word bunad being tossed around when talking about Frozen costumes and the term bunad actually is a 20th century invention. It means Norwegian national dress, but it wasn't a thing until the 20th century. Even though it's based on a lot of the traditional folk wear, it's, it's still modern if you get what I mean. So I'm going to be using the term folk dress when I talk about Anna's dress. Most of the Norwegian folk dresses I've seen in art consist of a white long-sleeved high-collar blouse, a bodice, a skirt, and an apron. Every region in Norway has its own local design for the folk dress, but the silhouette was basically the same. Actually, just something to know, in several parts of Norway, mostly in cities, there has been no evidence that peasants even wore a localized regional folk dress. They just wore clothing that was very similar to other peasants in other countries. And that's because these cities or coastal towns had a lot more foreign trade and activity. The embroidery we see on Anna and Elsa's dresses are called rosemaling, which is a folk art that uses stylized flower ornamentation, lining, and geometric elements. Anna's dress is actually pretty accurate. She has all the components minus the apron. Her cape even has Norwegian pewter clasps. I literally can't pronounce that word. Clasps for extra authenticity and the rosemaling is pretty spot on as well. There are a couple things though. Her blouse would have fuller sleeves and probably be white. Because of the cold, she'd be more likely to wear a little jacket on top of her bodice and then a hooded shawl or cape on top of that. The colors are off as well. The color of her cape mauve is what it looks like, was actually the first synthetic dye and wasn't discovered until 1859. Her skirt would also probably have decorative ribbon trim at the hem. Overall, I give Anna an eight out of 10 for historical accuracy. And as for style, I'm a big color person, so I think that the color of a dress really affects how I feel about that dress, and I just don't love the mismatched colors in Anna's outfit. I think that the mauve, turquoise, and royal blue clash too much, and the dress would look so much nicer if the skirt and bodice matched. Also, I think the embroidery blends in too much with the blue skirt, which is a shame because it could stand out so much more with a matching black skirt but I'd probably give this dress a 5 out of 10 for style. This gives Anna a score of 6.5 out of 10. Last but not least is our girl Moana. Of course, Moana's story is fictional and based on a combination of different Polynesian cultures, but according to production designer Ian Gooding, they based the island of Montanui's design off of Samoa. The visual development artist Nesa Bove also based Moana's ceremonial dress off of Samoan dance attire. So for the sake of clarity, let's talk about Samoan dress history. As a disclaimer, there aren't any surviving garments or art from this time period as it was over a thousand years ago. And uh, Polynesian people used a lot of natural materials. Honestly, everyone used natural materials until like the birth of synthetic fibers in the 20th century. But anyway. Natural materials decompose over time, and so it's very hard to preserve things that are that old, or even find things that are even that old. But you know, times are changing. In 3050, my polyester dresses will still be alive, so... Anyways, I had to rely on more contemporary sources, which is not my favorite kind of source to look at, but I did find this amazing book by Tirangi Iroa called Samoan Material Culture. He was a Maori anthropologist and the museum director of the Bishop Museum in Hawaii in the 1920s. The University of Wellington has a wonderful digital collection of his work and he's just explored so many different Polynesian cultures, uh, material cultures specifically, and if you're into Polynesian culture at all, I would highly recommend his work. So when it comes to the costume design process for Moana. Um, in an interview with Bove, she said that the Pacific Trust sent representatives to Disney with authentic textile samples that would have been present in ancient Polynesia. Bove ended up using tapa and pandanus as the basis for most costumes in the film. Tapa, by the way, is a Tahitian word for the fine cloth made from a paper mulberry tree. 
It's called Siapo in Samoan and in a lot of English translations, it's called bark cloth. Both Siapo and Pandanus were used for a number of different things, not just clothing, by the way. In the interview, Bove also explains the importance of depicting the right textiles. Because the materials are natural, they tend to be more structured than a fabric. How they move on people and how they move when wet is different, and it's important to get those things right. As much of a fan as I am of 2D animation, Disney's CGI technology does have its perks, especially when it comes to looking at the characters' clothing designs. We can see texture so much more clearly with this animation style, and I think that's a magical thing because it definitely makes the film feel more realistic. So looking at ancient Samoan clothing, for everyday wear, men and women would wear a leaf kilt, also known as a titi, named after the tea leaves that compose the skirt or cordelin leaves in English. These kilts protected the midriff and served to conceal the lower part of the body. Leaf kilts were used for this purpose because such clothing does not dissolve in water, while siapo disintegrates when wet. These kilts were the only everyday garment worn before the 1800s. They were gender neutral, though women's kilts were usually longer to resemble more of a skirt. Men and women were topless at this time. Prior to European colonization, siapo was also used to make a sarong-like garment called a lava lava. These were worn as indoor change garments for women of higher rank. Everyone else was prohibited from wearing one. For special occasions, there were variations to the kilt, such as the feather kilt made from red feathers of a Fijian parakeet and worn by the village maid and young chiefs at village festivals. Using pandanus, Samoans constructed fine mats that were dyed or painted and then ornamented with fringes and red feathers. Fine mats were worn by higher classes on ceremonial occasions. This looks to be what Moana wears in the movie. So knowing all this, a more historically accurate Moana would be topless and she would be wearing a leaf kilt. Even though she is the chief's daughter, a lava lava is an indoor garment and she spends the majority of the movie outdoors. And then also the fine mat is ceremonial wear. So yeah, Moana would definitely not be wearing one on her voyage. So to calculate Moana's historical accuracy score, I would give her a seven out of 10. Disney did their proper research when it comes to looking at textiles, natural resources, and the overall silhouette of the clothing. But I'm taking deductions because of her top and misuse of formal wear. And yes, before anyone comes at me to state the obvious, I do recognize that in our society, it would not be well responded to if Disney had a topless Disney princess. I'm just merely pointing out the historical inaccuracy. For style, I give Moana an 8 out of 10. Um, I love the use of natural materials to create her jewelry and clothing details. Red, which is also historically accurate, looks great on her. This gives Moana a combined score of 7.5 out of 10. So that's the end of this video. That's the end of the series until Disney makes more Disney princesses. I hope you enjoyed it and I hope you learned something. This section was a lot more fun for me to research because I guess like over time, Disney has become less lazy or just more invested in rooting their characters in a time and place. And so it was a lot easier to start researching and really streamline the process because I wasn't like thinking like, oh my God, well, this is like Denmark, but it's the Mediterranean, but it's the Caribbean. So yeah, thank you for that. Disney, you're doing good. And just a reminder, because some people took my ratings really seriously and they're really not serious. Everything is subjective. I'm just really using it as a way to structure my information. So if I offended you, I'm very sorry. <laughs> Once again, I am taking requests for future videos. So if there's anything you want me to do, just put it down in the comment section. I also got a lot of comments on my last video about the shirt that I was wearing and some people were like, oh, I love your Ariel cosplay. That's just how I dressed all the time. It's not a cosplay. So if you're interested in my personal style stuff, my Instagram is also linked below. Anyways, I'll catch you guys next time. Thank you for tuning in for this long.